Okay, so my name is Olivier Comiotanio. And if you can move to the second slide already. Um, a bit of information about me. Um, I'm an integrative and relational counsellor and a psychosexual therapist. I'm in private practice. Um, I am accredited by the British Association for Counsellors and uh, Psychotherapists. And I'm accredited, an advanced accredited sexual minority therapy with pink therapy. 99.9% um, .9 of my uh, counselling clients are gender or sexual minorities. I only have one client who is straight or heterosexual. I'm French, Spanish and I'm also a UK taxpayer. And I put those three together because I think this is what I'm going to be talking about, the difficulty to actually work with different identities and negotiate them and make them alive and, and work the conflicts between different identities. I have an interest in gender identity and sexuality and my approach is not pathologizing to any GSM, any gender and sexual minority. Shall we go to the second one? So I started in 2008 a certificate in sexual minority therapy open to uh, qualified counsellors and psychotherapists run by Pink Therapy who's uh, based in London they're running the, uh, 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 the independent um, leading organisation in training therapists in working with gender and sexual minorities and Dominic Davies who uh, run the company and run the course um, interviewed me and said, well, what is the uh, sexual minority you're not familiar with? And he said to me, well, okay, uh, it seems like you know quite a bit. What about asexuality? I thought, I don't know anything about asexuality. He says, fine, you're going to have to do a presentation to your peers on asexuality. I was very disappointed. I'm going to be honest. I thought, this is not very meaty. Uh, it's not an interesting subject. This was 2008. I didn't know anything about asexuality. And I had to present to my peers. And today I'm here. Next slide. So what do you do when you have to do research? <laughs> well, the first thing you do is you interrogate your search engine, your favorite one. And on asexuality, what I found was a lot of <coughs> microcellular organisms and fungi doing things to themselves. And that's not really what the subject of asexuality is about. But what is interesting in that already, I think, is the idea that we link asexuality and sexuality with reproduction. So that's already a very interesting thing to, to bear in mind. Second one? Sorry, it's the fifth one. So what is asexuality? At that stage, I had no idea. And that's 2008. There wasn't much available, even on the internet. I kind of worked out that asexuality was different to chastity, to celibacy, to frigidity, to hypoactive sexual desire disorder, and that asexuality actually is not a pathology. Shall we go to the next one? The closest thing I could find was from the DSM-4, which is uh, a manual that um, lists all sorts of uh, psychological ailments. Something like that. A deficiency or absence of sexual fantasies and desire for sexual activity, marking distress and difficulty. So asexuality at that stage was about a pathology was about a deficiency, was about something going wrong. So I was very frustrated and I didn't know what to do. Couldn't find anything on the internet, couldn't find any book, couldn't find any journal, couldn't <coughs> find anything until out of the blue someone came to me and says, I am asexual. So I said, That's exciting. Um, I need to do a presentation. Would you, would you help me? find out about asexuality, and she said, yeah, no problem. And I said, can I just write briefly a questionnaire and send it to you, and just send it back to me, and 
I've got something to work on. She said, yeah, that's fantastic. So I did so. And she contacted me by email and said, oh, actually, I've got two or three more people who want to answer the questionnaire. And I received five questionnaires. And I thought, that's exciting. I've got a little bit of material here. And a few days later, I received another 10, and another 5, and another 15, and another 10. And I ended up, next slide please, with 310 self-defined asexuals answering my questionnaire, which was only devised for one person. So it wasn't a research, it wasn't an academic research, but I ended up with a lot of data that I had to work with, that I had to do something with. So I'm going to share a bit of figures with you, and then I'm going to share with you some of the voices of these asexuals, what they've said to me in their questionnaires. Most of the questions were yes or no, or brief answer. And the last question of the questionnaire was, is there anything else you want to tell me about yourself? So, some figures first. I worked out that 48% of the people responding to my questionnaire were female and 52% male. So there's more asexual in my research, more male asexual than female. The average age of the people answering my question was 37. 61% never had experienced sexual intercourse. And 76% decided or realized in their mid-teens, so around 15 or 16, that they were asexual. Can we go on the next slide, please? So we're talking about asexual orientation here. And I asked, who are you attracted to? Are you attracted to the opposite sex? To the same sex? To both? To neither? If we take first the male um, answers, answers from uh, male asexual, there's almost a clear divide. It's almost a quarter for each, opposite, same, both, and neither. If we look at the female, we're talking about attraction, who are you attracted to, not necessarily sexually. Um, there's a huge variation. 41% are attracted to the opposite gender, the opposite sex. 7% to the same. 18 to both. Neither for 33%. And 1%, I think, didn't understand the question. Um, to this, there's something I'd like to bring, which has been written by Lisa Diamond, who's an American um, therapist. She wrote about sexual fluidity in uh, women, and how women are more attracted to a relationship rather than a gender. So, the figure here might be very fluid in themselves, if we were to ask a few months down the line, the same people. Next slide, please. Considering asexual um, individuals, I don't know why I consider that they could be asexual, but they could still be in a relationship. And I found some really interesting material here. 59% of the asexual female who answered are not in a romantic or amorous relationship. 53 of the male are. 61 never have been in an asexual relationship. And 70% of the male have never been in an asexual relationship. So that is 47% of the male who are in a relationship, though they are asexual, and 41% of the female who are in a relationship. So that's an interesting thing to consider that one can be asexual and in a romantic relationship. Next slide. So 41% of the women, 46% of the men, are in a romantic and amorous relationship. <coughs> the partner. For these asexual people in a romantic relationship, 40% have a partner who's not asexual. 85% are 
are in an open relationship. So that brings a bit of a debate of what constitutes a relationship, what constitutes a healthy relationship, and is monogamy a healthy way to run a relationship? Come along. So already with very little data, there's a lot we can start wondering and asking. Um, <clears throat> some asexual uh, explained to me that they had, they were very resourceful to accommodate the needs of their non-asexual partner. Um, in terms of um, gay couple where one was asexual and the other one wasn't, the non a sexual partner would go to sonas and have his sexual activities dealt with outside. Um, whilst heterosexual couples, a few of them told me that they had this arrangement where the lover of the non-asexual partner would live in-house. So in a way, the sex was happening in-house, but it was completely hidden from the public eye, and the lover was considered as just a lodger. So where does it hurt? Because we're talking about hidden things here. And that was, again, 2008, people answering 71% saying that their choice was generating curiosity. So when one comes out as a sexual, one has to explain something. 64% feel pressure to justify and explain their choice. 74% feel people do not respect their choice. 78% found their sexual orientation was not accepted. 79% experienced oppression or discrimination because of their sexual choice. 64% felt nobody support them or their choices. That can be from family, can be from friends, peers, can be from church, can be from all sorts of institutions. 2% find support from AVEN. AVEN is the only um, forum at the time that I could find, uh, online forum and website. It's the Asexual Visibility and Education Network. Um, it has 13 languages, it's, there's 13 versions of the website, and asexual post a lot of their thoughts and share their thoughts. Uh, my respondents, only 2% knew about uh, Avem. 17% had very negative views of Avem or Avem. I think it's because it's an American website, and the rest have no idea. Uh, in 2008, there was no one to support them emotionally. So that raises the question of community. Some difficulties have been brought up by uh, these uh, questionnaires. Some people have, uh, I've counted 16 cases of rape. There, there might have been more. So 16 people have said to me that they've been raped, and as a result, they decided to, or they realized, they were asexual. Could there be more? I don't know. A lot of people are saying, I need to keep my asexuality secret, to keep safe. And I refer you to the previous slide, all the um, prejudices against asexuality. A lot of people are hide, were hiding behind their relationship. I'm with a partner, therefore nobody's going to ask me if I am sexual with my partner or if I'm asexual. Um, people would hide behind work. I'm too busy working to have a relationship. Behind their faith, it's absolutely fine with my faith not to have sex. Or their age. At my age, I don't need to have sexual encounters. Other difficulties when you are asexual, where do you find a partner? And how do you negotiate your asexuality with your partner? <coughs> you are asexual, you fall in love with someone, you don't need sex, you don't want sex. 
How do you negotiate that? How to have children? There was a couple of cases which were really, really distressing of asexual couple who approach social services to adopt uh, children and social services ask them how come you don't have children by yourselves and the couple said we are asexual and social services said well this is not normal if you are asexual you're not fit to be parents I'm gone, I'm back. so is any sexuality more acceptable how long is a piece of string what is the right amount of sex one should have? What works for you? 2008-2009, I discovered that there was no interest in asexuality from the caring profession. No understanding. So maybe something is really happening here in Warwick. And we can move it a bit further. Next one. So here's some voices, some um, people answering to the last question, is there something you'd like me to know about yourself? And I must say, these, this, there's four slides and they're quite, quite powerful. I'm going to go through them all. But they're quite powerful and when you receive five or ten of them per day and you open them and you read them, it's really, really moving. Really, really moving. But it also highlights the fact that people need to find the words to explain what's going on for them. And where do they find a way to explain what's going on for them if their sexuality is considered as shameful or abnormal or a pathology? So the first one, a guy said that he caught HIV from his first ever and only sexual experience, and he's afraid of passing on the virus. Someone said, I didn't choose to be asexual, I just am. Someone said, asexuality should be brought out in the open so people don't feel oppressed. That's a very, very important point. Asexuality is not a pathology. There's nothing wrong with being asexual. It's the context, it's the environment, it's the social pressure, which is putting all the stress on asexual. I hope you understand me, because nobody else does. Please publish a paper that says I'm not mentally ill, I beg of you. So once again, sexuality is extremely linked to mental well-functioning. Who says? Someone said I'm very normal. A Catholic priest from Ireland, I believe, said I have more problems with the whiskey than thinking about sex. Has no questions about his asexuality. I always hated sex. Now I'm a respectable widow. I'm able to be myself and it's wonderful. This is a woman who had been in an abusive relationship for years and years and years. And her husband was forcing himself onto her. And now she's finding her identity. But has she got words and has she got someone to talk to? A man said, how do you tell a woman you want a sexless relationship? I don't want to go to therapy. So there's an expectation that because we're human beings, we have to have sex. So if we don't want sex, how do we manage that? How do we explain it? Do we have to go to see a therapist? How do you say you find sex revolting to people? Surely I can't be the only one. Someone said, I don't like being touched, but I would like to meet. So there's a need for relationship, there's a need to be social animals, to be with others. But that doesn't mean we need to have physical contact or sexual contact. Someone suffered pressure from his parents when he um, said he was asexual and he received 10 shots of ECT, electric compulsive therapy. So electricity driven through his body to make him sexual. Someone said, I might not be asexual forever. Another one says, doctor says I'm a deviant. The priest says it's a holy union. He is married. 
I have, he suffers pressure to have children, so my wife pretends she's barren. So again, people are having to cover their asexuality and lie. Someone said he's very lonely and would love a partner, but he's been called a freak and he is gay. But he's been thrown out of gay bars because he doesn't want to have sex. So that brings an interesting question. Can one be a gay man if one doesn't have sex with men? Can a woman be a lesbian if she doesn't have sex with other women? And the last one, that's why we're not lesbians. My girlfriend, <coughs> that's an interesting concept here, an asexual couple together, but they're not lesbians. Next slide. Ah, oh, sorry. My counsellor says I'm questioning my sexuality, but what if I don't have one? What do I do then? I hate being like this. I think there must be something wrong with me. That's a typical process. We don't understand what's going on, therefore we turn it against ourselves. It's my fault. There's something I've done wrong. Thank you for taking me seriously and not thinking I'm a psychiatric case. I'm longing for a relationship. A touch is electrical and can be very erotic. Interesting idea. What constitutes eroticism? People think something must have happened. Sex seems to be the reference these days. Is there an over-sexualization of our society these days? Is that healthy? Someone's been rejected from the gay community. It's not very open-minded and it seems very sex-orientated. Someone's been beaten up by boyfriends for not sleeping with them. It's never heard of any sexuality. Is it recognized as a valid sexuality? Or am I a deviant in some way? I'm afraid to ask my doctor. The last slide on voices. Very powerful statement. Asexuality will never be accepted until it remains clouded in secrecy. So a bit like other GSMs, like other gender and sexual minorities, gay, bisexual, queer, queer, king, whatever, we have to come out, we have to expose ourselves so that we are going to be recognized. So if asexuality remains visible, how can asexuality be known, recognized and accepted? I do not want people to know I'm not normal. How can I be accepted when doctors say I am not normal? I'm very disappointed. I've let my family down. This person had expectations from his family that he should be married, he should have kids. Once again, we're linking sexuality with procreation. A psychotherapist that identifies as asexual said, I'm not sure if I hate my partner for having sex or needing sex or if I hate myself for not being able to fulfill his needs. And the last one, I think it's fantastic that someone is interested in asexuality. It makes me feel I am not alone. Do you know how good that makes me feel? You will never know. So once again, in 2008, the only forum, the only place where asexual could share anything was through websites. So the, the avon is the Asexual Visibility and Education Network, remaining anonymous on blogs and forums, I just raise the question, how visible is that? Next slide. Um, so what about masturbation? Is that considered as a sexual act? Do <coughs> asexual <coughs> masturbate? Well, there's a lot of debate about it, and a lot of asexual consider that masturbation is just a mechanical thing, it's just a release of energy, it's just a feel-good factor, and that's their way of having sex, 
not needing to share it with anyone. Other people think that it's mechanical, but it's boring. According to a study from uh, Prose and Graham in 2005, 2% 2 of asexuals masturbate. And I was reading a book uh, recently on asexual. Um, it's recognized that there might be 60 million asexual in the world. It's 1% of the population. So what is intriguing, what is difficult to understand, what is complicated in, in, in what I came up with. The first one for me was the invisibility, is that if we don't speak out, we don't get power. So if an asexual is repressed not to speak out, where does an asexual get power? From community, I suppose. But in 2008, there didn't seem to be an asexual community. There seemed to be a population of asexual linked via various websites. But there was no very, not really forums and, and places where asexual could meet. No vocabulary. And I'm thinking now more no vocabulary in the mainstream discourse. Could one be hetero asexual, trans asexual, homo asexual, homo romantic? There's all sorts of words that facilitate the way we can describe ourselves. Words that have not been described yet, invented, or they are still not mainstream. Relationship values, I talked about that earlier on. What constitutes a relationship? Can we have a relationship without sex? Can we have a relationship with sex only? Sexual identity. Does a gay man who doesn't have sex with other men can call himself gay? Or do you have to perform sexually to claim a sexual identity? And then there's loads of different cultures <coughs> that accept asexuality. And we're not talking about abstinence of sex, we're talking about just being asexual. Kenya, Maoris, the American Indian, some Muslim um, faith, the Free Church of Scotland. Next slide. So in the absence of sex, some negative messages that permeate. First, it's not normal not to want sex. Another one that couples need sex. And the other one is that something is wrong, let's fix it. So there's a pathology, there's a cause for it. Just a question to think about. I'm not saying I have the answers to it. Some positive ideas. We've seen that there's communication in an asexual couple, or in a couple where one of the partners is asexual. There's intimacy. There's choice, values, commitment. There's the idea that sex is not love and love is not sex. And that's really interesting to talk about all this and open the debate because it's going to start challenging our own sexuality and our own identity. In terms of resources, books, there's not many things. I found the Boston Marriages um, published in 93 in the States, which is um, taking the title from the play, The Boston Marriages, um, about a romantic and asexual, romantic and asexual relationships between women. Three French books. Don't know why the French have such an interest in asexuality. Uh, no Sex, Avoir Envie de ne pas faire l'amour, by Peggy Sass, a very, very good book for those who can read French. And No Sex Last Year, La Vie Sans Sex by Fontaine. Uh, quite recent books, 2010 2006. Um, strangely enough, they both have an English title. I have no idea why. And the last one, La Révolution Asexuelle by De Tonac. 
next slide. It's going to be the last one. Um, some authors to mention who wrote a lot about asexuality. Prose and Graham, Shero, uh, Irwin, and a couple of websites that I found at the time, 2008, then 2009, on asexuality. And my email address, if anyone wants to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, if you could stay on the podium just for a second. Um, we've got a couple of minutes if anybody wants to ask any questions. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Um, I'm not being tortured. <laughs> but, uh, there are any you questions know. from there? Um, I was just wondering if your resources <coughs> and um, like your findings are online anywhere? Because they look yeah. quite useful. No. Um, could I email you and you can send them to me? Thank you. Um, you raised the question just at the end there. It said, do you have to have sex to claim a sexual identity? Would you say, like, could you allow <coughs> that idea more? Do you think it's true? Do you need to have sex to claim a sexual identity? What do you think? I think it depends on every individual. And I think this is one of the problems I, I uh, encounter with gay men coming to my practice and saying... Um, they're having too much sex and they don't have intimacy. It's almost as if their sexuality, their sexual identity is validated by performing a lot. But that's beyond the point. This is just sex. So I, do, I don't think, personally, that um, the sexual act defines your sexual identity. But for a lot of people, it could be different. I think that sometimes that may come as a result of a hypersexualized society that we live in now. I mean, in advertising, nudity, drive, in advertising, everything's hypersexualized. It's creating, it's creating um, a benchmark, it's creating uh, um, an idealization of what sex should be, which I don't think is healthy. What sex is for me is not going to be what sex is for you, and the right amount for you might not be the right amount for me. And if there is an authority that can say, this is what you need to be a healthy, functioning sexual man, that becomes a bit fascistic. So it's about everyone finding their own level of comfort with their own sexuality, rather than thinking that there is a model which is portrayed by the media, by the press, by the club scene, by the amount of partners you have and the amount of orgasms you can reach in a night. Day. It's interesting that the DSM is already in there, isn't it? That despite the fact there's obviously not been very much social discussion, that we actually probably, I mean, even us here today, I mean, that there's not really anything that you can say is, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, material, let's say, but DSM has already come up with a, with a mental health category. I mean, I think that's quite a concern, actually, that if we narrow down the, cons the, the categories that DSM has produced for mental health in relation to sexual behaviours, uh, it, it, it still leans really towards heterosexual sex as mm -hmm. being uh, mm -hmm. less pathologised. Most of this seemed to be uh, quite, quite definitely in there. I didn't know asexuality had been defined by it. There's, yes. there's two uh, diagnoses. One is HDS, HSDD, hyposexual desire disorder, mm, mm. and the other one is SAD, SAD, which is sexual aversion disorder. So wherever you go, really, whatever you do, we don't do. Because okay. I read that there's some time ago that there was a suggestion to include hypersexual desire disorder in the next mm. one, the DSM. I think, I think it is, so a, too I think they're trying to. I don't know if they have, yeah. but the, the DSM-5 is about to be produced. But the extent to which yeah. is that narrowing gap of what is deemed to be non-pathological mm. sexual desire, too much that yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, just write some yeah, kind yeah. of The other thing which is interesting is that it's also um, driven by big companies who manufacture yeah. um, mm. and <coughs> sorts of other uh, sex stimulants. So, if we pathologize their sexuality, the more we pathologize it, the more we can market a, a, a new medicine and make a lot of money. Yeah. Mm.
And just as much of interest, you're training, is that right? You're, you're, finished, you're a psychosexual tra- therapist, is that right? Yeah. I just wonder anything you're training. I'm finishing Discussions about asexuality were part of your training. Is it part of my training? Yeah. Uh, I don't think it is, but it will be because I'm going to present it. Okay, but it's down to you to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, there's going to be a lot of low desire and arousal problems and all sorts of other psychosexual health issues, but the asexuality negotiation and um, experience is not going to be uh, discussed in the course. Are there any more questions? Oh, yeah. Um, I sort of found it interesting, sort of carrying on from the thing on the DSM, was that the definition given in the DSM, which is the closest, um, is, uh, isn't is quite the same as the asexuals themselves mm. use for it. So you sort of got this sort of moving people about we, where the DSM thinks they are, well, mm-hmm. where they actually are. I think that's what what's interesting is that I think it needs to come from the asexual community, the vocabulary, not from uh, laboratories or scientists or even therapists. As a therapist, I facilitate the client's story. I help them develop their own narrative. I don't impose my narrative onto them. And I think that's what's important with the asexual communities, to come forward and tell their narratives. There's also something very, very interesting that is happening in the um, asexual uh, movement. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a new definition, which is demisexual. I don't know if anyone has heard about demisexual or semisexual, which is the attraction, sexual attraction to a partner, which is only linked to romantic feelings. So someone is, in essence, a sexual until that someone is involved romantically with someone. So already we are developing some words, some vocabulary, some ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.